Time now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Café Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Café Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, Desert Betrayal. There are five times in a day when a foreigner like myself tries to stay off the streets of Cairo. That's at dawn, noon, late afternoon, sunset, and just after dusk, when the Moezen appears in his minaret to call the faithful to prayer. At that moment, all activity stops, and the devout Moslem kneels on his rug facing Mecca. Keeping away from them at those times is one respect we can pay their religion, and they appreciate that respect. But I guess I wasn't watching the clock this particular evening. My cafe tambourine still held the intense heat of the day, so I got out and walked down the crowded Sharia Nagoon toward the Nile to try and catch a cool breeze. I just stopped to glance at a big poster, something about a rally for the politician El Marmot Bay, when I heard the voice of the Muezzin in the minaret high above me. Suddenly, all sounds of activity stopped as the natives faced east, their foreheads to the ground. As quick as I could, I ducked back through a narrow passage off the street that led to the winding stairs of the minaret. I waited there until sounds from the street told me prayers were over and the Kyrenes were again about their business. Then I was about to be on my way when... The scream came from the minaret. As I turned and looked up, I saw the bearded Muezzin in his flowing robe stagger out of the tower, pitch headlong down the winding stairway. He rolled over and over, and he didn't stop till he sprawled at the bottom, almost at my feet. It was like something out of a bad opera, and for a split second I couldn't move. But the red splotches from stab wounds spreading across his white robe snapped me out of it, and I rushed over to him. All right, easy there. Try not to move. Who did this? You've got to tell me. Listen, who did it? I guess he figured he was done for, and there was a look almost of ecstasy on his kindly face. But I didn't want to give up that easy. I made a move to try and stop the bleeding when I heard heavy footsteps coming down the stairway. It was another figure in the robes of a muzin. Only he had a black field boots on. Come on, hurry up, will you? Help me with this man. Shut up and get back. We gotta work fast. He's sure Quiet, to die. I said and move. I'm not Must going I anywhere. Tell you again? Since when does him away and carry a luger? Don't touch him. You've stepped in where it doesn't concern you. Yeah, maybe it's lucky I did. Think again, my friend. It's your misfortune. I felt the blow of his heavy luger across my face, and that was all. Only a roaring like a calm scene on the desert, me spinning with the wind, till it seemed to pitch me back down to the foot of the minaret. The pain in my head drove me to my senses, and when I opened my eyes, it was pitch dark. The dead body of the kindly Muezzin lay beside me. Just as I realized I was clutching something tightly in my hand, a flashlight stabbed right in my eyes. So, it is you, Mr. Jordan. Get up at once. Well, good hunting, Greco. Who called you? There was no police call. Ali! I'll ask Sergeant Greco. Take the knife from this man. Knife? The one in your hand, Mr. Jordan. You need not feign surprise. You do not deceive me. Getting ideas already, Greco? Hand over the knife. I'll take it. I don't use knives. Indeed. However, it was in your hands, stained with the blood of the sacred Muezzin lying dead by your side. Look, don't you know a plant when you see one? Enough. This time you have overstepped yourself, Mr. George. Okay, arrest me. Get it over with. Perhaps that will not be necessary. I need only to call the people in from the street to witness this thing. What are you getting at? When the news spreads that their revered religious leader has met violent death by the hands of an unbeliever... You will be disposed of very quickly. You'd like that, wouldn't you? I would be helpless against the mob. You see, Mr. Better Jordan... get some sense now, Greco. If the Moezen's death gets out, there'll be a lot of repercussions. You think Sabaya'd put another stripe on your sleeve if that happened? My personal ambitions have nothing to do with this. Think it over. 
Uh, Mr. Jordan, uh, you will understand that I had no intention of disclosing this to anyone uh, not as yet. Sure, Greco, sure. Uh, Ellie, bring another man. You will take the Moazin to the Miraret and hide his remains there. It will be done. Uh, one moment. Under no circumstances will you breathe a word of this to anyone. Is that clear? It is, Sergeant Greco. Quickly now. And you, Mr. Jordan, will come with me. <laughs> Greco waited only long enough to watch his aides lift the Moazin and carry him carefully up the steep winding steps to the tower. As they disappeared into the dark, he gave me a shove and I walked ahead out into the street. Neither of us spoke a word on our ride to headquarters. I was taken to Sabaya's office and a couple of guards held me there for maybe half an hour until Sam made his appearance. Greco was with him and they motioned the guards outside. It was all just a little too deliberate. Uh, Greco been telling you things, Sam? I keep silent until spoken to, Mr. Jordan. Then let's get at it. Jordan, I have Greco's statement. You were found at the foot of the Mongol minaret beside the dead body of the muezzin. Did he tell you I'd been knocked out cold, Sam? A trick, Captain. He was trapped and could do nothing but pretend that he also had been attacked. Then explain the shape my face is in, Greco. Your face gets smashed up in many ways, One Mr. moment, Jordan. Greco. Now, Jordan, I will hear your full explanation of this affair. I was standing at the foot of the tower stairs during the last call to prayer. Did you, an American, not know better than to be there at such a time? I ducked in there to get off the street. Mm. Go on. And the Moazin rolled down the steps right at my feet. Before I could get anything out of him, somebody else in a Moazin's robe showed up. There is no other Moazin at the Minoret. You're right, Greco. He wasn't a Moazin. He wasn't an Egyptian. He had on German field boots and he carried a Luger. Jordan, what fantastic tale are you trying to make hey, me listen believe? Listen to me, Sam. The guy roughed me up against the wall and then slapped his gun across my face. He is lying, Captain. Ask Mr. Jordan how he got this knife in his hand. You can see for yourself. Put the knife on the desk, Greco. I, I do not wish to look at it again. As you wish. The Moazin had been stabbed four times. I thought it best under the circumstances to have his body hidden in the menorah. Yes, 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 yes. You acted most wisely, Greco. I was only doing my duty, Captain Sabaya. Uh, Jordan, about this man with the Luger... Would you recognize him if you saw him again? You bet I would. Uh, you, uh, you have told me everything? That's right. And you can explain nothing of the other similar acts of violence against our holy men here in Cairo? Well, there have been others. This is the third Muezzin to die in the past month, all by the knife. But why, Sam? What's it all about? I do not know, but I intend to find out. Jordan, there are things a man like you would not understand that my people take their religion most seriously. Quite often, our emotions become strongly involved. Well, maybe I do understand, Sam. Every man has a religion, whether he knows it or not. But there are differences. Sure. I've knocked around enough to learn to respect another man's beliefs. That's why I get off the street. We will not go over that again. Oh, okay, but you can't hold me, Sam. Indeed I can, Jordan. You will be committed to jail pending further investigation. So that's the way it is. That will be all. Greco, I must hurry to the El Mahmoud Bay political rally. We have promised him police protection. Put Jordan in a cell. This way, Mr. Jordan. Oh, Greco, you had best place him in the old cell block across the alley and under heavy guard. I know better than to try and figure out what goes on in Sabaya's mind, but I had a hunch he was locking me up more than anything for my own protection. And the old cell block would be the last place a mob would try and hunt me out. Greco made a big thing of it as he and two others directed me down a corridor to the back door. A dim bulb over the entrance was all that lit the alley. Greco motioned across to a dingy sandstone building about 30 feet on down, and I moved ahead. I had taken not more than a dozen steps when it began to happen. A whole bunch of them came out of nowhere. Everyone hooded, surrounded Greco and his guards. I made quick work of it. Stop it at once. I come at you. One of the hooded men was out of the scuffle and had me by the arm. Get moving, Jordan. What is this? I'll call it a rescue. Maybe I don't want it. Shut up, you fool. Now move. By that time, they were all around me, dragging me up the alley. Somewhere back, I could hear an alarm sounding and the shouts of more men running out of headquarters. But already, we had reached a side street where a light field truck was waiting, its motor running. The hooded figures piled me in, the driver put it in gear, the wheels spun, and we were careening off down the narrow winding streets. Now we must have traveled every side street in Cairo to shake the police. Finally, the truck roared across the Bulak Bridge of the Nile, through Giza, on west and north above the Nile Valley as it meets the desert. As the truck picked up speed, the men relaxed their grip on me, peering ahead to the onrushing road, so I had a chance to look them over. 
Well, the top man had called it to a rescue, but I knew better. Every one of them was wearing German field boots and carrying a Luger. The jump was a risk, but I knew there was nothing alongside but soft sand and was the only way. I waited till we hit a sharp, bumpy curve, and I was off and rolling. And the fourth time over, I was on my feet, clawing my way through the brush. Then they opened up. I dived for a ditch with the wind knocked out of me, and I stayed there, my face in the sand, waiting for them to flush me out, knowing exactly what would happen when they did. You are listening to Desert Betrayal, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Travel to the ends of the earth tomorrow night with Dick Powell and Sidney Hasso, who will recreate their original screen roles on CBS Radio Theater. To the ends of the earth is the story of the expose of an international narcotics ring and makes for an exciting story. Remember Dick Powell and Sidney Hasso tomorrow, Monday night at 6. <laughs> Now we return you to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, Desert Betrayal. It was a peaceful evening as I stood at the foot of the minaret and listened to the Moazin's call to prayer. But all that was changed a few seconds later when the Moazin lay dying at my feet. A man wearing German field boots and a gun to match planted the killing on me. Not long after, as I was being taken to a jail cell, the same man with a lot of helpers broke it up, dumped me in a truck, and roared out into the desert. I remember jumping from the speeding truck, some gunshots, and not much more, till a breath of air hit me. And it wasn't air off the desert. It smelled of cheap gin, like my cafe tambourine after a hard night. It came from somebody bending over me. Get up, monsieur, before they find you. Oh. Where are they? Searching the brush and the other side of the sand dune. Up with you now. Yeah. Where, where, where are we going? To my hut. Only a little way. Allez, monsieur, allez! Somehow she got me to her hut and dropped me on a cot. The dive off the truck must have jolted me plenty because right then I passed out for a while. And the next thing I knew it was daylight and I was wide awake and choking for breath. She was sharing her cheap gin with me. <laughs> <laughs> the gin, it helps, n'est-ce pas? Oh, do they sell stuff that bad? Oh, so I, it is champagne you wish. No, no, I'm sorry. I woke up too quick. Oh, it is nothing. Anyhow, you took a lot of chances, sister. I am Suzette. Perhaps another drink now? No, 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 no thanks. I should wish. Uh, any of those guys come around? No, monsieur. They went away. Uh, looks like you got a good hideout here. Oh, well, we all hide from something, n'est-ce pas? Yeah, me from too many things. You, uh, you do not tell me who you are, monsieur. The name's Jordan. And an American who flees from many men with guns on the desert. Oh, I hopped off a truck. They were taking me someplace. But why? Your guess is as good as mine. Many trucks have been going into the desert. Yeah. Where to, Suzette? I do not know. But something is going on out there. You, you were captured, monsieur? No, oh, rescued, they called it. <laughs> you make a strange riddle. Oh, yeah, it's a beauty. The Moazin is stabbed to death in Cairo. Not the first to be killed. But whoever did it figured I knew too much. Before the police could salt me away, this gang grabbed monsieur, me. Monsieur, what were they like? Well, they weren't Muslims. They were men who speak good English and carry lugas. Oh, sacre nom. You got it figured, Suzanne? Oh, always it is the same. So it was with the betrayal of France. Always I do not realize... What are you talking about? Monsieur, in France they call me a traitor. It was not so. I did not know I was being used by the enemy. It makes some sense, huh? Oh, now I am a poor French woman in Egypt without credentials. I must exist as best I can. When there is an opportunity to sell munitions and guns into Egypt, what can I do? The trucks are taking munitions into the desert? Oui. But I did not Who's know. Who's the deal with, Suzette? Ah, uh, it is a bad deal. Right, come on, never mind the gin. Uh, Who'd you sell the stuff to? Well, there... There is a man named Frank Kruller. 
Where do I find him? A, a houseboat on the Nile. Dahabi are 16. All right, let's, let's have some more. Oh, no, no, monsieur, already. I have said too much. You rest now. Uh, you will need much strength for what is ahead. So I waited out the burning heat of the day in her hut. All the time, I tried to get more out of her about crueler and the munitions going into the desert. How that tied in with the Moazin's death. But from then on, Suzette closed up tighter than the cap on a bottle of Coke. Well, with a little food and a lot of sleep, I was ready to go by sundown. Suzette helped me into Giza. From then on, I was on my own. I thumbed a ride across the bridge, but before I went down along the river, I decided on a phone call. Captain Sabaya speaking. Hello, Sam. Jordan. So it is you. I just didn't want you to worry about me. Where are you? What are you doing? Oh, relax. I'm all right, I tell you. You don't have to rescue me. Rescue you, indeed. You will return to headquarters at once. Sorry, I got a big date. Where are you going? To see a guy named Crueler. Crueler? Frank Crueler. Any objections, Sam? Jordan, listen to me. There are things you do not understand. Why not? You are not a Muslim, but I am. And I can tell you that you are in great danger. For your own protection, come back to jail. Uh, thanks for the advice. See you later, Sam. Jordan, for the last time... <laughs> Then I was on my way to see Kruler. I couldn't have missed his Dahabia on the Nile if I'd tried. It was a floating palace, all lit up with music coming from someplace and real important-looking people going on board. With a day's growth of beard and so on, I wasn't exactly in shape for a party, but I went anyhow. Only a big pile of muscles at the entrance stood in my way. Retrace your steps, uh, friend. Don't get upset, Buster. I didn't come to see you. State your business here. Well, maybe I got invited. Only those of influence and wealth come here tonight. Ah, uh-huh. something uh, real special, huh? A reception in honor of the great El Marmot Bay. I've known bigger politicians. Yeah, back to the streets with you, English. Not till I see Frank Kruler. He's not here. Well, let's look around. Yeah, back now, no. stop it, cow. No. What is going on here? <laughs> Somebody was coming through the lighted doorway toward us. The one man I wanted to see more than anyone else. I'd last seen him under the minaret as he slapped a luger in my face. Who is this man? He is no one. I tell him to go away. I will handle him, Jerub. So it is you, Jordan. Yeah. I take it you're crueler. I am. <laughs> you know, Jordan, you interest me. <laughs> I'll bet. You made good your escape last night. Is it not foolhardy to walk back into another trap? Not if it gets some answers. It so happens that I would like to talk to you, too. Come this way. No, no, let's talk here. Sorry. I fear you have no choice. A glance at the shadows told me there were others besides Jarub covering for Kruler. So I followed along with Jarub close behind. We went down some steps away from the party going on above, through a narrow corridor to a door that Kruler opened. He motioned me in, and I was face to face with a guest of honor. One Napoleon-sized, puffy, gimlet-eyed Egyptian politician sporting a monocle. El Marmot Bey. Who is this man, Kruger? The person who persists in making trouble for us, El Marmot Bey. Ah, Jordan, of course. Excellent, excellent. You the top man in this deal, Marmot Bey? Perhaps more than you know. What audacious motive brings you here? A lot of question marks about guns and munitions you got your hands on. Stuff that's being hatched out in the desert somewhere. Most interesting. From whom did you learn this? Oh, skip it, Mormon. I'm not on your side yet. <laughs> I had hardly hoped for that. What else you know, Jordan? Just that you're playing for something pretty big. Killing Muslim leaders is dangerous business. What are a few lives if they serve my purpose? You tell me. El Mahmoud Bey, your time is most valuable. The others are waiting. As you say, Cruella. The hour grows short. Jordan, finding the source of your information and how much of it you have divulged to others is most important to my cause. I'll bet it is. We have ways of getting it from you. With a Luger? Wait, Cruella. Jordan, who else knows you have come on this Dahabia? A lot of people. It is possible. Let him go, Cruella. What happens to this man after he leaves here, you may decide. Of course. Jarob, bring the others. 
throw this man out. At once, master. Aren't you up to it yourself, Cruller? No, no, not that Get way, Giroux. Out the window. Perhaps, Jordan, the waters of the Nile will drive you to your senses before it's too late. Get Get out. Out. <laughs> I got plenty of Nile water, all right, but I didn't head for the shore. I saw them moving along the bank waiting for me. Then a little boat took off downstream trying to pick me up. But they didn't know I was hanging onto the anchor chain. In a little while, I was pulling myself back into the little room. It was empty now. The noise of the party upstairs covered for me, and I started looking around. A couple of shoves, and I had the closet door open. What was inside didn't surprise me. A stack of small arms, Lugers, man liquor rifles, and cases of ammunition. Next, I tried the desk in the corner. The minute I cracked the top drawer, I had what I wanted. It was a list of various muezzins in Cairo. The top three names were scratched out, and I figured they were the ones who had already died. Maybe the rest were next. But it didn't say why. I folded the sheet and shoved it in my pocket. Suddenly, there was a soft step from behind. Before I could move, there was a silken cord around my neck, drawn tighter and tighter, and once more, thick blackness poured in. I was slow in coming out of it. First, I thought I was still lying at the minaret beside the dead Moisin. Then I was in a ditch with a gin-soaked woman bending over me. Finally, I opened my eyes. The light from a window almost blinded me. Outside, I could see other buildings, and I knew we were in some abandoned army camp. I tried to move, and I realized I was tied securely to a chair. The bare room held just me and Frank Kruller. I salute you, Jordan. For a chance adversary, you have proved quite formidable. Ah, uh, skip the build-up, Kruler. Where are we? To the south is the Guattara Depression. It was used as an anchor in the battle for Egypt. Only you're using the place for something else. As a temporary hideout, it serves our purpose. Any munitions dumped, too? Spare your strength, Jordan. You'll need it. <laughs> like for what? El Mahmoud Bey, Mr. Jordan awaits you. Well, Jordan... For a man with big plans, Marmont, you give me lots of attention. Why? Because I wish to know what people are in possession of certain information. Who are they? I'll give you an answer. But to my question, not yours. Because I soon will become master of Egypt. Yeah. Mm. It will be done. El Mamad, is it wise? Let him know. There are but three of us, Kruller. He has no means of escape but the eternal sand. Thanks, my man. I know about the munitions and guns. Now, where's your army? <laughs> you Americans are indeed naive. Superior intelligence is more powerful than armies. Your brains and who else? At this moment, my loyal followers are at strategic points in Cairo and elsewhere in Egypt, awaiting the hour. You think that's all it takes? Clive took India with only 123 men, Mr. Jordan. I had it right, didn't I? You start out killing a few Muezzins, one by one. Nothing upsets a Muslim quicker than an offensive toward his leaders. And now more of the Muezzins are to die. When the people see their government is unable to cope with the atrocities, they will rise up and overthrow it. You got it all figured out, haven't you? Already there have been incidents. Soon the anger of the populace will move it to frenzy. There will be uprisings growing in violence. And that's when you step in. Yes. At that moment, the great El Marma Bay will appear as their liberator. Yeah. The only trouble is it won't work. Indeed. Again, the mind of the West finds the mind of the East an insoluble riddle. Well, don't get me wrong, Marma. You might use the religion of your people to get into power. Only you've forgotten one thing. Yes. What is that? Your people will still have their religion. How long do you think they'll be fooled? We Americans have a saying for that, if you're interested. I am not. Your interest, Jordan, is in your own welfare. Well, think about it. When the people find out they've been duped, what do you think happens to you? At that time, my power over them will be assured. Egypt will enter an era greater than the pharaohs ever knew. Ah, hold it, Mohammed. Back that idea up with some more figures. Give me one example of a tyranny founded on religious oppression that has ever lasted. Mr. Jordan, the fact of the moment is that you will die. Tell us what we wish to know, and that will be swift and painless. And if I don't... Death in the desert is very slow. 
No man has ever withstood the heat or the sun in his eyes. Need I say more? I get the general idea. What is your answer, Jordan? I told you, it won't work. Mm -hmm. Very well. Krilla, take him outside. I suggest that you turn your attention to me, El Marmad Bey. At first, I didn't recognize him without his uniform. But it wasn't a mirage. It was Captain Sam Sabaya. Kruller grabbed his Luger from the table as Sam kept walking right on in. How did you get here? That's important, Kruller. Watch that Luger, Sam. I'm tied here. I can't help you. That will not be necessary, Jordan. So, Captain Sabaya, the desert must claim another victim. That we shall soon see, El Marmad Bey. But you had no way of knowing. Not everything. But certain things have come to my attention. When Jordan phoned me he was going to Kruller's Dahabia, I followed along, and I've been following ever since. You think your authority amounts to anything here? My authority and my uniform remain in Cairo. I come here only as a Muslim to write a grievous offense to my religion. You come to this forsaken place alone, without even the proof? You can find proof, Sam. Look in the other buildings. They're loaded with arms. Search Kruder's houseboat. In good time, Jordan. Enough of this. Kruder, dispose of this man at once. A very great pleasure. <laughs> Crueler aimed, and then it happened quicker than I could follow. Sam's foot came up a second before the shot, and the gun clattered across the room. Crueler dived in. Sam crouched like a panther, and then slammed Crueler over his head into the arms of El Marmot Bay, and they went down. I'd always thought Sam was pudgy and slow-moving, but he gave me the show of my life. He used every trick on those two guys, and I'd ever known and a lot more. The second time Marmot came up, his stomach got mixed up with a left, and he was finished. But Crueler tried for more. All the time, I couldn't move. Krula went to work with his heavy boots, and that's where he made another big mistake. Sam flipped him into a corner, where he piled up like a stack of ten pins. Then suddenly it was all over. Hey, I could book you for a main event, Sam. Jordan, you will make no joke about this. Such, such tactics are, are most distasteful to me. Okay. How about getting me loose here, huh? Well, you will, you will tell no one of, of this incident. Sure, sure, just untie me. You know, Jordan, there are many things that you do not comprehend. Sam, get me out of here. Well, Sam finally untied me. We got El Marmot Bay and Crueler back into Cairo, and from then on, Sam was his old official self. It didn't take him long to round up all the Bay's loyal followers, and I don't have to tell you what happened to them after that. I, uh... I was going to send Suzette a case of good gin, but she'd done a fade-out, and nobody tried very hard to find her. Me? Oh, I've learned a few things. Sam Sabai has given me jiu-jitsu lessons. It's CBS, again at this same time, next week, for another story of adventure and intrigue. When we take you back to Cairo and the Café Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. Jack Moyles plays the title role with tonight's script by Larry Roman and Gomer Cool from a story by E. Jack Newman. Rocky Jordan is produced and directed by Cliff Howell, with original music by Richard Arant. Larry Thor speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thank you.